Hi, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here virtually. I'm sitting here in my, my house in California, but um, it's a real honor to, to have the opportunity to speak with all, all of you. And what I thought I would do is, it's actually a, a nice follow-on to the previous talk because uh, our previous speaker, Mark Slack, was speaking about robotic surgery. And what I'll talk about is molecular surgery. It's really a way to alter the DNA in cells and organisms in ways that allow precise correction of disease-causing mutations and also allow scientists to do all sorts of other kinds of manipulations of genetic material in living cells and, and organisms. So quickly, I will, I will tell you what CRISPR is, and then we'll talk about how it works for genome editing and what that is. And then finally, uh, a few words about how CRISPR is, is impacting our current uh, coronavirus pandemic and may help with future pandemic preparedness. So CRISPR is a, a tool that allows genomes to be altered. So the, the scale right now with genome technologies are, are, uh, are extreme in the sense that we have increasing access to whole genome sequences, human genomes that are now, we talk about the $100 a genome, human genome on the horizon. And at the other end of scale is now the ability to actually alter that, uh, that information that's stored in the genome. And this brings together these extraordinary opportunities to both understand genetic information, but also to manipulate it in ways that were previously not possible. And in the case of CRISPR, it's a great example of how fundamental research leads to technology development, because this is a, an area of science that started in a very obscure place with the study of how bacteria fight viral infection and ended up with a technology that's transforming the world. It's uh, making it possible to alter DNA sequences precisely in any cell type in any organism. So in bacteria, CRISPR provides immunity. It's a way that cells can protect themselves from viral infection, and they do it by creating a small molecular recording of a virus, and do, they do that using the viral DNA. And this cartoon shows the ability of uh, the, um, the cell to store a piece of viral DNA in a place in the bacterial DNA, the bacterial chromosome called the CRISPR locus. And that stored DNA then provides a template for making molecules of RNA that can in turn direct proteins called CRISPR associated proteins to find and destroy DNA that has a matching sequence. And so the, the cell literally creates a, a genetic, I like to call it a genetic vaccination card for those who remember those and uh, allows the cell to remember in a molecular sense, viruses that have infected it in the past and provide protection should they show up in the future. So this video shows uh, how we imagine this working for, for bacteria. Um, oops, let's see. I don't know if I can get my video to play from, from here. Um, and if not, that's fine. But basically, uh, the, this, is, this is a video that would show uh, cells being infected by viruses and then using this CRISPR mechanism to provide protection from future infection. Now, that, that was the, the original um, uh, research into the biology of CRISPR. But what emerged from that work is that CRISPR has the ability to cut DNA precisely. And furthermore, it can cut DNA at a programmed position. And once I and my collaborators understood that molecular mechanism, we were able to harness it for a different purpose that's uh, shown here. So in, uh, in human and animal and plant cells, when DNA receives a double-stranded cut, like in this cartoon, instead of being destroyed in the cell, it actually gets repaired. And during repair, a small change to the DNA sequence as shown on the left, or a much larger change, such as insertion of a new piece of DNA can occur. 
And that biology is fundamental to genome editing and it plays into the function of the CRISPR system beautifully as shown on the next slide because the CRISPR system, this protein called Cas9, allows DNA to be cleaved at a precise place. And importantly, the scientist or the bacterial cell, in this case, the scientist can control where DNA is cut. And so imagine being able to program this protein to recognize DNA and break it at a place where a change to the sequence is desirable. And then the cell takes over and, uh, and, and that's when the actual genome editing takes place. And importantly, it became a, a, an easy to use technology with work that we published in, in 2012 because it, we showed that it could not only uh, how, how it functions in nature, but also how it could be simplified into a two component system in which a single piece of RNA shown here, the single guide RNA could provide the address label for Cas9. And it was trivial to change the address um, in cells to allow this tool to be useful for any genome in any cell type for any type of editing. And so that was really the, uh, the uh, uh, beginning of the CRISPR genome editing era when we now have a technology that is readily available to scientists uh, worldwide. This uh, video is also not playing, which is too bad, but, uh, but it's, it's, uh, uh, if anyone wants to see this, it's on our website, innovativegenomics.org. You can see this video and it shows how CRISPR editing, we think, works in cells to create precise changes to DNA. But I'll, I'll explain why this is so useful. So I wanted to give an example of sickle cell disease, which is a, a, a disease caused by a single base pair mutation in the human genome, a single letter change in a gene for, for a, a gene encoding a protein for hemoglobin that carries oxygen in our blood. And when that mutation occurs, then uh, if there are two copies of that in a cell, then those uh, cells make a form of hemoglobin that is prone to, to uh, aggregation. And that results in the classic sickled shape of patients that suffer from this disease. Now, the, the uh, the source of this, the, the underlying genetic cause has been known for decades, but until now we didn't have a way to actually make uh, any effective uh, 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 cure certainly of this, of this disease. And what's so exciting is that CRISPR offers a tool for exactly the, that can be used for exactly that purpose. And recently uh, several companies as well as academic laboratories have initiated clinical trials to use CRISPR in sickle cell disease. And in fact, one patient, Victoria Gray, has received CRISPR therapy for sickle cell disease, and she has been effectively cured of her disease. So that's led to a lot of excitement in the field and thoughts about how we can now expand this technology to treat others that have this or other types of uh, rare genetic disease. I think that the ability to deliver these gene editing molecules into cells will continue to be a challenge and, uh, and, and is pro probably rec represents the next breakthrough in the field that will allow genome editing to be even more useful for a, a wider range of, of disease types. And I also feel that it's essential that we work towards uh, affordability for this technology as well. Right now, of course, it's, it, it's experimental and expensive, and eventually it would be, uh, I, I would love to see this become a standard of care for certain diseases and, and of course, be affordable as well. Um, Safety is, is essential, and uh, there's, there's uh, as I said, I think a cautious optimism based on early clinical trial results that were released over the last year. And um, I think the, the next step here is really ensuring efficacy and uh, safety on a larger scale. At the same time, there's a lot of interest in ensuring that this technology is used ethically 
And I've been involved for the last several years in, uh, in particular in discussions about using genome editing in what's called the human germline, making heritable changes to cells uh, that uh, are uh, either sperm or egg cells or embryos that where the, the changes that are made introduced uh, into a, a, uh, an embryo if implanted and used to create a pregnancy could create a, a heritable change in, in people. And so this has been a topic of a very active international discussion. And just recently, a report was released that was uh, sponsored by the National Academies in the US and the Royal Society in the UK that took a deep dive into this issue of heritable human genome editing and made important recommendations for managing this technology going forward, including ensuring international transparency about the ways that this technology could in the future be used to create these types of changes. And finally, I'll just in the last uh, minute or two, I will just mention that CRISPR, in addition to being a uh, technology for genome editing, it has other capabilities, including the ability to report on a, 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 a DNA or RNA sequence that is detected by a, a CRISPR enzyme. And very briefly, the way this works is that there are certain classes of CRISPR proteins known as Cas13 and Cas12 that have the ability to recognize a target sequence that matches the, the sequence of the guide RNA and then to cleave reporter molecules that have fluorophores, um, dyes appended to them that can release a signal upon cutting. And so this is a way that these systems can be used to detect things like uh, viruses and the coronavirus is a key target at this moment. So there's lots of excitement about the potential that in the coming months we will see a CRISPR-based point of care diagnostic that will allow rapid uh, detection of coronavirus and in the future of other viruses as well, creating a platform for pandemic uh, preparedness. So uh, the, the uh, potential of this technology continues to advance. I think the, the keys are going to be delivery and, and control of the editing, as well as, of course, ensuring safety, effectiveness, and, and, and access. And uh, the possibilities are, are extraordinary. It's really a, an exciting time to be working in this field. I, I welcome questions from the, the audience if we have them. And, and thank you again for giving me the opportunity to present here. Thank you, Jennifer. A really, really exciting talk. Thank you so much. Yes, and I do have lots of questions. I mean, you mentioned at the end the endless possibilities. So when I invite you again in five years' time, what kind of applications are you going to be talking about to us in that time frame? Well, no question. We'll be talking about more uh, sickle cell disease um, strategies, for, and, and each, each one is slightly different, but I think I, I have great expectations for, for more successes there, as well as other blood disorders that result from a single uh, genetic mutation. I think what's really exciting is that there are other applications on the horizon that include treating eye disease, uh, treating uh, um, well-known uh, diseases such as uh, muscular dystrophy that uh, could, could benefit from genome editing. And so I suspect in five years, uh, we'll, we'll be talking about those, uh, at least trials and, and maybe real results as well. Yes, and, and uh, I guess key, a, key, a key part of this equation will be the affordability of the technique in terms of how we are able to democratize it. Uh, what do you think will be necessary in terms of cutting the price or pushing the price down in terms of the cost of this technology? Well, two key things come to mind. One is that on the one hand, the great thing about CRISPR is that it's a personal, it can be personalized because it is a programmable system. On the other hand, that raises the potential that each uh, different variation of the technology might have to be individually tested in, in people, and that's simply not practical. So I think that one thing that needs to happen is that there needs to be a framework for uh, regulatory approvals of the technology that 
streamline that process. So that's one thing that's, there's a lot of very active discussion about this uh, right now that I, I'm hopeful will lead to some uh, creative approaches there. And then the other is uh, something I mentioned in the talk briefly, which is that we really need to develop better ways to deliver these molecules. And this is not a problem unique to CRISPR, of course, it's a, you know, it's a problem that any therapeutic faces that how do you get molecules where they need to be. And uh, I'm, I'm also likewise uh, really excited about the, the, the new uh, technologies on the horizon for delivery as well. Um, a final question from our audience. Uh, do you care to comment on, there's been talk about CRISPR-based vaccines. What's uh, your take on that? Um, well, yeah, CRISPR-based vaccines. I, I think that my view of that is that, um, you know, CRISPR might be useful for helping to deliver um, uh, DNA or even RNA molecules into cells. And I know some research groups that are, are taking that approach and using CRISPR in that, in that fashion, um, especially for vaccines that are RNA or DNA based, uh, such as what we, we actually heard earlier in the session about uh, from, from Moderna um, and other companies that are using an RNA based vaccine. Um, but I think that uh, that the reality is that these these systems, uh, you know, they face their own challenges of delivery, as I just mentioned. So I, I think that realistically, my view, at least in the in the short term, is that CRISPR is going to be great as a diagnostic. I think that's we already see the the opportunities there, and it'll take a lot more development to turn, to use it in a, a therapeutic fashion or for vaccinations. Uh, probably not for this pandemic. And in terms of diagnostics, you mentioned we could see some based on CRISPR in the, in, in the next few months. Was that the time frame? Well, I, I'm hopeful. Yeah, and no guarantees, but uh, sure. you know, the chemistry certainly works. That's for sure. Okay. So yeah. there's no question about the chemistry working. It's now really a question of can it be packaged in a platform that is readily accessible and affordable? And uh, there's a, a lot of, lot of uh, team efforts around this, uh, both academic and companies that are doing it. Um, my, again, if I had to guess, I think what we'll see first is probably a laboratory test based on CRISPR. So that would be a test that would um, be uh, similar to what we're using right now with the PCR-based test, but performed mm -hmm. in a lab. And then maybe after that, uh, hopefully right on the heels of that, will be a point of care test that will allow uh, you know, a small device to be placed in classrooms or, or uh, uh, buildings where there can be rapid monitoring of patient samples. Brilliant. Jennifer, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us and to our audience. Thank you.